And you write in the in the foreword to the new book about your going to New York and uh, going to the Brill Building and that sort of experience. The f um, uh, well, look, I'd been in the music business, well, in, a, in the sense that I'd been a musician, I'd been in America, and then I came back into the film business. But when I had this piece of luck of by a writing, you don't have to say love the lyrics, and then managing the albums, which were probably the number three group in the world after mm. Stones, the Beatles. So I went from knowing nothing and being nothing to knowing nothing and being a top manager. Yeah. Um, and so I was learning. And I went off to America, and we were shown the Brill Building by the publishers at United Artists. And it was just surprising. I mean, you had all these people who were, who were hugely successful songwriters, many of them making millions. And yet they went in from 10 to 5 and sat in this hideous little building in cells and played their piano and wrote songs. And to us, coming from England, the idea of going to the music business and having success and making money was not to do that, it was to yeah. stay out and out at the Ad Lib Club and go in as late as possible and drink a lot at lunchtime. And um, so it, it seemed to me this wasn't. It wasn't what the music was just meant to be about, and to the Americans, this was what the music was about. But we came back to England, Vicky and I, and went on with what we were doing: sex, and drink, and having fun. Yeah. And do, do you look back now, and can you see some of the the logic and what they were trying to instill in you in terms of um, it's just all about the song, and the, the song is part well, of it. Well, you know, at that moment they were right it was all about the song this was just at the moment when the charts has only recently become the top 10 records as against the top 10 songs and really what you had at the end of your credit industry was the songs that you owned and had a copyright to uh, now from from 1955 on the charts became the top 10 records and the difference was that when it was the top 10 songs every record company was persuaded by the publisher to make a version because all they wanted to do was sell the song so the versions competed with each other, but it wasn't really competing, it was all helping bring the songs number one. As soon as it was the records, they didn't want any competition, one record needed to dominate the other, so they, they switched and only one artist was allowed to record the song. Right. So bit by bit, that, that made the artist much more powerful and you got to a stage where really a second-rate song could be a hit with a top artist. So that was a big, big switch and when rock music came along it switched even bigger. Because there you had a situation where um, rock groups sold themselves not on their songs, but on their lifestyle, their imagery, their sexuality, their fashion, and the songs were part of that lifestyle. And so music publishers were really thrown for six when it started, because they, they no longer had to sit down and just listen to the songs. They might even choose a group whose songs weren't very good, or certainly weren't very coherent, but they could see that they were going to find an audience. So for a, you know, a man like Mike Stewart, where he started this conversation with, he would have no concept of how to do that. He would just listen to songs. And yeah, wouldn't even look at the visual side of that song. Couldn't even, yeah. But from 1965 on, you were selling lifestyle and, uh, and, and artists and personality probably more than songs. Mm. But now in full cycle of things and where music and records is really they're disappearing, music has mainly come back to being heard as single songs, uh, streamed, frequently uh, without any announcement of what it is you're listening to so the artist becomes less and less important mm. and the song really has come back to be more important so perhaps Mike Stewart should have just stayed alive another 50 years and he'd have been right again yeah or there will be a new Mike Stewart some sure will, will oh I hope not he's an ugly artist <laughs> <laughs> and um, you mentioned streaming obviously and then that's where we're at just now how do you think the music industry is going to survive this kind of seismic change well, the music industry has this there's no disaster in the music industry. Yeah. Record companies say, oh, it's a disaster. There's no disaster. The music industry grows 64 million two years ago and 68 million last year. It's a billion, sorry, billion. Um, it's going up. There's the overall amount of money the general public is prepared to spend on music is going up. Records sell less, so record companies moan. They've been the top dog for 40 years. They don't like it. But overall, the money's there, and there'll always be entrepreneurs who come along and make sure if the public want to spend that much money, there'll be a way of taking it off them. But it won't be records. Streaming, <coughs> well, it's, it's obviously working, and it's, it's the immediate future, but there'll be something else probably. Uh, it's very difficult to know. I mean, uh, you know, now we all have iPhones, and the whole knowledge of the world's in our hands. You hardly need education. Uh, perhaps you won't need streaming. Perhaps, perhaps in a few years, the iPhone will just be a chip which we have, and we don't even have to click it. We can just somehow activate with our brain and search what we want. So all these new songs will be fed straight into our head. Um, but it will be something like streaming, and I'm not sure how the money will be. Yet. 
gathered in by the industry, but maybe by advertising, and maybe it will all be live. But that 68 billion figure won't go down, it will always yeah. increase. There's always an appetite for music and, mm -hmm. and in pop culture. Obviously, just to sort of rewind a little bit, um, so when, when you got into later stages of your career and moving into the 80s and then you had the rise of MTV and suddenly the visual side was almost more important than the music um, and you essentially, was it right thinking you discovered Juan? Would that be... Well, I think Wham discovered themselves, really. Yeah. They came event in due course, yeah. so they arrived on my doorstep. And one of your previous books covers going to China with them. And yeah. um, what was that period of music like? Obviously, it's a completely different era from the 60s, but how do you remember that, that period? Well, I mean, basically, uh, Wham came to, or Wham didn't come to us. I met Jazz Summers, who was another manager who had had a group who had been big and then had broken up. It was called Blue Zoo, and I had a group who was very big from Japan and they broke up. And we got together and said we ought to work together and really find the biggest of big groups. And so we made a list of all the artists who were already just beginning to happen, so we didn't go right back to the beginning. Mm. And Wham was on that list, and we finally got to meet them. And they were very ambitious. They had two hit records, they had a lot of problems, they didn't have their record contract, they wanted to change, get out of their record company. Um, so they presented the whole list of things they wanted to do, and they wanted to be the biggest group in the world in one year. That's not, not possible. The biggest group in the world for a British group has to mean the biggest group in America. Uh, and the rest flows from there, and it can't be done in a year. The whole mechanism of breaking America, where then they didn't have national press or national television, it always takes four to five years. But George was positive that was all they were going to give it. So somewhere in the course of the dinner and a few bottles of wine, one of us, Jazz or I, said, perhaps we can make you the first group at the playing communist China. And George said, that's good, go and do that. Uh, and that suited me because I love Asia. I'd fallen in love with Asia years before. And it sort of suited Jazz because Jazz likes doing the nitty gritty of everyday work, which I don't much like. I'm, I'm a schema holly for Jazz to work on. So um, I schemed and he worked. And my scheming meant going off for two weeks every month, sort of going to Asia and having a nice time, and talking to a few people in China to see mm. if I could make this work. And after 15 months, I pulled it off. And so Wham played in China, and it was, it was extraordinary. Because they were on the front page of every major newspaper and every major magazine, Time magazine, Newsweek. <coughs> on every single news broadcast in America, ABC, NBC, CBS every hour on the hour, just 10 days running everything. And it really changed them from a group, an English group which people knew but weren't yet spread nationally. In 10 days, they moved from that to exactly what George wanted, the biggest group in America. So for once, the group had done it in less than a normal four or five years. Mm.